Test, test, one, two, check, one, two.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The remainder of you, if you'd like to come on in and take your seats, just like a horse sale, we're ready to begin. An incredible turnout. He'd have been proud of you all. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of Brian and Leslie, their children, Will, Catherine, and Carson, and the Graves family, on behalf of Ashton and Fasig Tipton, we thank you for being here today to truly celebrate the wonderful life of our friend Bill Graves. I am not a particularly religious person. I deeply respect all religions, so between us, we will thank the Almighty and Mother Nature for bringing the sunshine into our lives as we remember and say goodbye. And what a magnificent day it's turned into being today. Bill and I shared a liking for the music of James Taylor, and there are a couple of lines in Sweet Baby James that came to my mind. Maybe you can believe if it helps you to sleep, the music works just fine for me. And I must remember in my remarks today that we have the press, the social media, a senior member of the cloth, and young, young adults with us. If I say anything inaccurate, inappropriate, or just out of line, I take full responsibility for my actions, and unlike Roseanne Barr, I will not lay the blame on Ambien. I'm from the world side of the racing world, so this address is given on nothing but hay, oats, and water. I first met Bill before my phasic Tipton days in Virginia, when we were both in our early 20s. Our paths didn't cross much until Bill and Michelle started Grave Stable and began selling two-year-olds in training in 1989. He was truly a model consigner, preferring to do everything perfectly to his liking and relying on the sales company to meet his high standards and to do their job accordingly. It was during this period that he met and befriended Larry Enza Sr., then in charge of most aspects of all our auctions. I had joined Fasig Tipton in 1976 under John Finney and Larry and held a nostalgia for the heady days of the late 1970s and the early 80s when it seemed we could do nothing wrong. But in a decade of adjustment and downturns, the company went through what could be euphemistically called some hiccups, which resulted in three ownership changes in the space of just six years. There were a lot of sleepless nights and self-doubts at that time. In 1992, at the invitation of company owner John Hedinger and his charismatic guru, Johnny Griggs, Chuck, I think Johnny would like to be called a guru, don't you? In road Bill, our shining knight in heavily starched jeans and expensive cowboy boots to reorganize our selected yearling sales process. It was a new beginning. The thoroughbred industry was going through some seismic changes, and the old phasic Tipton way just wasn't cutting it. I was reluctant to accept it at first, and sheltered behind the old standards of John and Larry, and cussed every time I saw another of our sacred cows go by the wayside. But look at it this way. At my first Saratoga in 1977, there were 42 individual consigners, plus many agents, offering 240 yearlings in August. By 1992, Bill's first Saratoga as a phasic Tipton man, it was down to 22 consigners and 165 yearlings. By 2017, Bill's imprint on Saratoga in August produced record sales for the company of nearly $70 million. Not bad for a skinny little kid from Lynchburg, Virginia. The buyers that were even then becoming increasingly picky, and Bill was the right person, the only person, who made the best decisions on what was a desirable Saratoga yearling. Once Bill had firm control of the process, I cannot ever remember hearing the much often heard criticism that this year's catalog wasn't up to standard. As I came to grips with this new order, my respect and friendship for Bill grew immensely. Bill has been blessed with many close friends. 
I would like to think that I'd earned a spot among them. In the last 10 years or so, we ate, socialized, and played a lot of golf together and had what I can only describe as one hell of a ride. I want to share with you a story of Bill's legendary sense of humor. All the way through this slide presentation, you'll rarely see him without a smile on his face and just how mischievous he could be. Bill always respected his senior, Larry Enza, but Larry had a short fuse and could sometimes be cantankerous. After a long, hot, trying day inspecting yearlings in Ocala, our team of Bill Walt and Peter Penny took Larry back to check in at the Ocala Hilton. Larry was in need of a shower, but more importantly, a good stiff cutty sark. He was waiting for the next available receptionist at the hotel when a rather officious older lady shuffled into the line. As Larry went forward, she very loudly told whoever was listening that Larry had pushed her head and that she was next in line. Madam, he exclaimed, that is totally wrong, and berated her for her false accusation. She looked to her husband for help, but when he saw an indignant Larry doing his best gunslinger imitation, he decided that uh, discretion was much the better part of valor. Larry went ahead and booked in under her glaring glaze. Next morning, the team met up in the lobby and started their day's schedule. Larry, as usual, sat in the back seat and buried himself in a newspaper, mostly to avoid the playful banter of Walt and Bill in the front seat, who just delighted in taunting him. After 20 minutes, the car pulled up, Larry dropped his newspaper, and prepared for the first yearling inspection of the day. To his surprise, they were parked outside an elderly care facility in the middle of nowhere. What the hell are we doing here, he said. Bill and Walt replied, well, we thought you'd like to come up here and kick a little ass just to get the day started right. <laughs> we will all find our way of remembering Bill and the joy he brought to our lives. I am hoping Phasic Tipton will find a way to commemorate what he did for our sales at Saratoga. Perhaps it'll be a tree. Perhaps it'll be a plaque somewhere on the grounds. We are expanding our accommodation for yearlings in 2018 with a new stabling facility there. If it happens my colleagues think of naming something for him there, I would respectfully suggest we call it Bill's Barn and not the Gravesyard. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Mr. Walt Robertson, who will say a few remarks. Well, I can say one thing, as Terrence referred to, what a crowd this would be for a horse sale, a yearling sale for Bill Graves. <laughs> I've considered Bill Graves as one of my closest friends for over 25 years, and as evident from the crowd here today and at the visitation the other day, this crowd and a lot of people share my sentiments exactly. He will be sorely missed by each and every person in this room. But how lucky are we all to have Bill Graves as a friend and a big part of our lives. I'll tell you, as Terrence talked, did Bill ever help shape this company? In 1992, Fasig Tipton was struggling just to survive. The market was beyond terrible, and Fasig's image was really struggling. Bill came on board that year and brought with him the, rest the respect of the entire the thoroughbred community. And in no time, almost immediately, our image improved, 
the company not only survived in a small part, in no small part due to Bill's talent and effort, Phasic Tipton thrived ever since. As with many things that he has been involved with, Bill has left this company and the community far better than he found it. Through the years, Bill's accomplishments in the show horse and thoroughbred industries were many. However, Bill's greatest single achievement is as a father to his son, Brian. Brian, who is a son any father would love to have. Bill has always been extremely proud of Brian and his accomplishments as a horseman. And Brian is on course right now to equal or exceed those accomplishments of his father's. The single thing that made Bill the proudest, though, is the job that Brian and Leslie, whom Bill loved dearly, have done as parents of Bull's grandchildren, Will, Cat, and Carson. I can tell you, one didn't have to spend much time with Bill to see that he cherished those three grandchildren and the time spent with them more than anybody can imagine. I can't close without talking about the love and the devotion that he shared with Ashton. Our hearts go out to the entire Graves family and to Ashton. As we mourn this loss, let's remember how much fun we had, the good times, ever how irreverent they might have been that we shared with Bill. Thank you all. I would like to invite Brian to say some words to you. What a touching tribute to my father this, ga this gathering of people truly is. Since my father's passing, I've received countless messages from friends and family. Superlatives such as mentor, friend, gentleman, impeccable horseman, great man, class, and legend have been used. I knew at a very young age how special my father was. I've always wanted to be by his side. We didn't have much money growing up, but I felt like the richest kid in the world. My dad could just make you feel like that. He was a wonderful teacher. At every stage of his life, he taught me about whatever he was engaged in. In Virginia, my dad would school his show horses at work. I remember he would have me on the pony at the same time, giving me instructions. It was important to him that I learned to ride at an early age. When we moved to Kentucky, at Treehaven Farm, he taught me about raising mares, foals, and yearlings. At Kennington Sales, he taught me about the auction process. And my first job was running tickets to buyers for him. When he went out on his own, he taught me to roll bandages, wash feed tubs, rake shed rows, and walk hots. He would always tell me that a strong work ethic was very important. And when I was 12, I was promoted to being his beloved lead pony, Baldy's groom, which was a very big deal. And of course, he made me do him up in all fours every night. <laughs> Through my teens, I groomed for my father, and he began to teach me how to show horses on the farm and at the sales. The seriousness of these lessons was stressed, and I practiced to perform. My dad would often quiz me on the confirmation of various horses as we worked. He would always tell me to quit talking about what was wrong with the horse and tell him what was right about the horse. 
My father also routinely quizzed me on the variety of trees on the farm. My dad and I bought our first horse together when I was 15. We worked on that one together, and it was a big success. When my dad took his position at Phasic Tipton, he expanded on his lessons of confirmation and pedigree, and I interned at Phasic with him for a year in college. When I took a job at Gainesway developing sales, my father and I continued to buy and sell horses together. Lots of horses. And each one was a new and individual lesson from him. I could ask him about anything when a problem came, and he would always be there in 10 minutes if I needed him. As my dad worked to expand sales at Phasic Tipton, I did the same at Gainesway. We were a team, and it was very rewarding working together in this way. I was very proud for Gainesway to be a leading consigner in Saratoga for the past 10 years, and I know that he was too. The truth is, I spent a lot of my life where I wanted to be, which was by my father's side. And that's exactly where I was at the end. With my father, I have no regrets. We will never forget the handsome, charismatic man with the great smile and beautiful hair <laughs> who could light up a room with his storytelling. The approval of my father was cherished, not just by me, but by so many of you as well. What a success he truly was. I will never quit trying to make him proud. A lot of you have seen a wonderful series on television called The Odd Couple. One of those was Bill Graves, and the other one was Dennis Lynch. <laughs> and I'll let you decide which one is which. Dennis Lynch, would you come to the stage, please? Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming here to honor our friend Billy Graves. My name is Danny Lynch, and I'm Bill's friend. Bill's dad, Reed. Reed Sr. had a Boston Terrier named Banjo. Bill would tell hilarious stories about Banjo and his dad and them running around Lynchburg. I always loved those stories. And you know, Bill, he uh, loved giving people nicknames. So I said, Billy, what about uh, let's try Banjo on you for size and see if it can catch on and maybe you'll have a nickname Banjo Graves. He gave me one of those looks that uh, uh, if you describe it, it's like when Billy said he smelt the wrong end of a goat. <laughs> but I tried that for a few days. Uh, I say, come on, Banjo, let's go to lunch. Yeah. Come here, Banjo, it's time to get in the car, we're going to go. He, Bill had quite enough of that. And he said, how would you like it if I just called you Danny? I said, well, that's all right with me. Well, 22 years later, Bill's never called me anything else. And when I think of all the uh, words that he had at his disposal and his vocabulary, I think I was pretty lucky to come out with Danny. Now, Bill took great pride, as everybody knows, in everything he did. Not only Brian and Leslie and the grandkids, but having Ashton on his arm when he would come into a sale or a cocktail party, he loved that. 
not only the way his horses were turned out, how his shed row looked, how his pony was tacked, the clothes he wore, his art, even his penmanship. And often he had little subtle reminders if he thought you were not keeping up to his high standards. Today I'm hoping Bill is looking down and approves of this tie. <laughs> the suit and the shirt of Joseph A. Banks, and that is totally unacceptable. <laughs> but he'd come up to me and he'd grab it and he'd say, Ferragamo, now you're talking. Now you're talking. And that would be all right until he found out that uh, my wife Susan had bought it for $3 at a consignment store. <laughs> and then he wouldn't like it either. And I remember many times the Saratoga Billy would come, uh, he liked to kind of introduce some of his no, new wardrobe items and up at Saratoga, which he loved so much. So he'd show up with one of his Armani suits and walk up and say, what do you think, Danny? Feel that material. It's a beauty, ain't it? Nice, huh? I'd say, yeah, Billy, you're looking sharp. He'd say, yeah, Danny, I figure my suit, tie, and my shoes are worth more than your car. <laughs> he also did a uh, bathroom remodel that he told me was worth more than my house. But such was our relationship. We would fight and argue over everything, sometimes just making things up to argue about, always ending with Billy roaring that wonderful life of his. One thing we seldom disagreed on was horses. We were partners in dozens of horses over 20 odd years and no, not one argument. In matters of the horse, if you didn't see what Billy saw in a horse, you were probably on the wrong side of that animal. And Bill was not uh, fond of practical jokes, at least the ones played on him. But plenty of them were. And that would send him into a furious rage. And as I always told Bill when he was with us, I will work tirelessly to find the guilty parties and bring them to justice. <laughs> and I say that again today. And looking around this room, I believe that some of those people are sitting right here. And maybe it's an opportune time to take the veil yourself of Father Clay's services after this memorial to make reparations. And people have been asking me these last few days, what's your favorite Billy Graves story? There are literally thousands of them. And picking a favorite would be impossible. But I've been thinking that about the best Billy Graves' story is just Billy Graves. And it goes something like this. You ain't gonna believe this. Get back. What's up, Mudcat? Straight as a gun barrel. Hame headed. He ain't no part of a horseman. They never even knew. He, he don't have walking around sense. Ain't no Rayfield. If she can't dance, she probably can't. <laughs> if he was a carpenter, his house would fall down. <laughs> he rode like Ned the coachman. Long finger. Couldn't ride in a box car with his shirt tail tacked to the floor. What? He's never done that before. <laughs> now you're talking. Ren 10 10. Short stride. Stung by a bumblebee. Long stride. Looks sporty as a house cat. We'll get more money than a show dog can jump over. Crazy as a cage cat. Noli. Sold the fur off of that one. She's a beauty. Big boy. Three fingers. Corrine. Put me down for a five. 
The roast chicken, please. What you doing, girl? Reading needs to get me right before we get in that tournament. Tight as a mouse's ear. New floor shine shoes. Johnny and D. Put me down for a four. Clean across the James River. Shut the. <laughs> Slick as seal skin. Common as hell. He's a running son. Horrible. You got to know the color of the cat you're dealing with. I swear to God. In closing, I want to say Billy was a great horseman, unforgettable character, and a cherished friend to all of us. And so, Billy, from Reedy, Rusty, Mikey, Paul Girl, Petey, my big friend, Bainey, Boydy, F. Farraro, <laughs> Terry Bob, and Danny. We love you and we'll miss you dearly. There's nothing like something that you said coming back to haunt you. So John Williams, remember that you told me this just the other day. I'm going to invite John up to say a few words. He said, just remember one thing when you're putting this together. Brevity and levity. So with that, John Williams, would you like to come up and join us? I hope I get this right, Bill, but someday I gotta face you. Uh, before I begin, I was, uh, I was called on the telephone by a dear friend of Bill's, um, many of ours, many of us, Tommy Lee Jones. And Tommy would be here, uh, he would have crawled here to be here had he not been tied up with that show that Bill sure knew about in Upperville. So Tommy said, would you say a few things for me really quickly? And I said, I'd be happy to. And he said, so, you know, um, I just want people to understand what a stickler for de detail Bill Graves was. He said, you know, we were kids together growing up. And then when he had that stable uh, of his own in Keswick, uh, he gave me a 30-minute lecture on just where to put the hay in the horse's stall so that when the horse was, had his head in the hay, he was profiled so that the prospective buyer would walk by and see the whole horse. Bill Graves didn't want him to see his ass. He wanted to see the whole horse. So that's from Tommy Lee Jones. And I know he, if he were here today, you would be entertained with some of the great stories. So let me try to do as Arnold Kirkpatrick told me years ago, John, you ought to make brevity your long suit. I can't do it, I'm half Italian. <laughs> My name is John Williams and for 41 years, it has been my great honor and privilege to be counted as a friend of Bill Graves. Webster defines friend as one, a person you like and enjoy being with. Two, one attached to another by affection or esteem. My dad used to say, uh, man's wealth is measured in the friends that he has. Whew. Look at this crowd. Was Billy Graves wealthy? And I'll tell you this, if Bill Graves was my only friend, I too would be a wealthy man by that measure. How do I tell you what this man meant to me? 
Most of us here are uh, or have been uh, associated with thoroughbred horses. Uh, so we all know of Bill's God gift of, of horsemanship. Um, at the visitation, somebody asked me, uh, John, do you know of a better judge of a horse than Bill Graves? And I said, well, I know a lot of good ones. No kidding, I know a lot of good ones. None better than Bill Graves. Those of us that knew him professionally, knew him as a friend, knew him as a horseman, would agree with that. He was a natural, uh, just a, one of those guys that, that had the it factor when it came to a horse. One of those rare guys that as, was as comfortable around the horse, any breed, as Tom Brady would be around a football or LeBron James around a basketball. Bill Graves was a natural. Sometimes being as gifted as one, at one's craft as Bill was at his is tough to handle. When he saw bad horsemanship or the lack of care given to a horse, by somebody that he was at a farm or wherever it was. If he saw that, it was, uh, it bothered him. But on the other hand, when he saw good horsemanship and people that loved the horse and took pride in their horse, he praised them for it. He didn't throw bouquets around, but boy, when he saw somebody that really cared for the horse, he praised them. He felt that the horse deserved no less, and he was right. I can tell you this, that the second day that Bill was in the hospital for the first time, I was down there, and Bill had been heavily medicated, and he was coming out of it, and, and uh, he, was, uh, he, he was speaking to us, and, um, and he said, you know, John, you're a good man, I love you. Ashton, boy, I love that woman. And Ashton said, boy, he's throwing a lot of love around today. And I told him, I said, you know what, now's my chance. I thought to myself, now's my chance to give him a jab. You know, I just love to give Bill a jab. And uh, I said, uh, Bill, you know, I've been down to Jimmy Herbner's farm where he's got a mare that I have with uh, Paul Manganero. And this was a lie because I hadn't been, but... I said, you know what, she looks like hell. I mean, she's got cracked heels. She, her mane's on the wrong side of her neck. He is not taking care of my mare. He said, hold it. He's taking care of mine pretty damn well. <laughs> and, and I guess it was Michael Levy said, or it was Bane Welker, he's back. <laughs> I first met Bill in 1977 when I was looking for a showman, was looking for a showman for Spendthrift Farms yearling consignments. I'd been at Spendthrift just a year before, and um, uh, the, we needed help, you know, uh, and so I was looking for really good horsemen. So I met Bill uh, through uh, my longtime friend and then later partner, Lee Eaton, who referred me to Bobby Powell who was Lee's uh, lead showman uh, at, at his consignment. And Bobby gave me Bill Graves' phone number. And that's how it started. Clay Camp and Lee Eaton were among very few consigners back then, 77, that used what I refer to as professional showmen. Uh, men that knew how to lead a horse from his shoulder with a light touch. Knew how to turn him and walking back to the prospective buyer and stop him dead on four points the way he should and then get 
and almost disappear at the end of the shank. These kind of guys you didn't find everywhere. People, and I'm gonna name a few, guys like Tommy Lee Jones, Noel Twyman. Boy, we could spend two hours talking about the Noel Twyman stories. John Coles, Billy Howen, Don Snellings, Bobby Burke, Jim Herbner, Bain Welker Sr., Bucky Reynolds, Chris Cole, Dennis Brown, Hugh Motley, Woodbury, and it goes on. These people knew their craft, and Bill knew how to select them. These men showed urines with nothing but a shifty in their mouth, or nothing at all in their mouths. Imagine that today. What a shock that would be for me to see that. And I can imagine what Billy thought. Bill was our lead showman and assembled a crew of several of these horsemen for spendthrift consignments. Bill's team made our horses stand out from other consigners by the way they were presented on the walking rings. The results were obvious when the hammer fell. Believe me, it's a horse show. Not a horse sale, it's a horse show. And those of us from that background, especially many of you, much more than me, know that that's true. Our friendship stemmed from a common bond we shared, the horse. We shared similar values in friends, in lifestyle, and we had, we had left our homes in Maryland and Virginia to raise our two sons here in the great Commonwealth of Kentucky. However, we differed in other ways. I always felt like an unmade bed around Bill Graves. You got the idea? Me with a pullover shirt, jeans, and red wing boots. And there's Bill with a starched collared monogram shirt with two folds on his cuff, just so, with ironed jeans, custom-made pigskin boots, Ray-Bans, I never heard of Ray-Ban until I saw Bill Graves wearing them, and of course, that gold Rolex. Those trappings never seemed over the top for me with Bill. No. Rather, they seemed like that they absolutely were made for Bill Graves. That's the way he should be presented. And then, his movie star good looks. Burt Reynolds, Clark Gable, Robert Redford, all rolled up in one guy. You know, it would have been easy for me just to envy Bill Graves when I'd see him instead of love him. Around 1979 or 1980, I asked him to be the yearling manager at Spendthrift. He thought about it for a week, and then he turned me down. But Bill knew that Kentucky was where he should be to be the best that you can be at your craft. And he came to work for Joe Johnson at Treehaven Farm. He, Brian, and a real cool Jack Russell Terrier, terrier named Rowdy. He always called him the Dowd. They became transplanting Kentuckians. My friend, Bill was there for me at my darkest hour in 1989. Whew. He was there for me again at my happiest, acting as an unassigned usher on the front lawn of John Bell Farm in a tent when Benny Bell gave me her hand in marriage. My pal. The fun we had under the big oak tree on the Saratoga backstretch watching a hopelessly outrun a firm catch sensitive prints as he went past the 
went past the tote board in the Jim Dandy. We spilled our Molsons. That's how excited we were. And by the way, I think that Bill would say now that the compelling question about the hereafter is, will there be beer? Cutting up with, some of you guys will remember this, cutting up with Dr. Fritz Howard, Lewis Wiley, Sandy Young, and me at the community court. We were living high when we were at the community court. Scrambling to get our yearlings back in their stalls as Albert Yanks all ran loose at 7C North. Watching a little Bay Philly win the 1987 Breeders' Cup Juvenile from Joe Lehman's suite at Hollywood Park and Bill exclaiming, Epitome, <laughs> trying painfully without success to water ski behind Don Snelling's very loud boat, enjoying a great derby picnic at the rest stop on I-64 or socializing in the Harbor View box on Derby Day as if we were big shots, Benny, Michelle, and me. Mooning someone in a car behind our van from the back window and later to learn it was Gordon Stollery driving. <laughs> Cold beer and Dennis Lynch's oysters at a six-man stag party on Ashland Avenue. I can't go into that, but you got to ask Dennis or Danny to tell you about that one. His ability to spin a yarn. Huh. One of the greatest raconteurs of all time. We all know that, don't we? Watching our sons grow to be the good men they are today, even under the handicap of such fathers. I miss them already. As Anthony Beck said, we've lost an irreplaceable friend. My only comfort comes from knowing how blessed I was to have Bill Graves call me his friend. Thank you. Good afternoon. Pretty short. Mine's a series of letters. Dear Billy, thank you for teaching me about confirmation. Boydy, look at that pencil thin neck. Look at that straight hind leg. Look how the shoulder and neck tie in together in November. Come on, Boydie, we gotta go look at all these great grade one winning mares. Quit looking at what's wrong with them in front. Look at the beautiful shoulder they all have. Billy's confirmation lessons were not limited to thoroughbreds. <laughs> Boydie, look at the beautiful ankle over there to the left. The ankle? Yes, Boydie, and she's got a beautiful long finger, too. <laughs> my, oh, my. <laughs> Whether it was thoroughbreds, humans, dogs, or whatever, they all had to have a good walk. Dear Billy, thank you for your dedication to the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. Your willingness to attend a TAA day at the races, to attend any social function that they had, or to be one of the judges for the best turned out awards did not go unnoticed by any of us. <laughs> 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 
Dear Billy, thank you for teaching me flexible scoring techniques at golf. <laughs> it didn't take me but one round to understand that Billy and I should never gamble on the golf course. The third hole, first drive in the lake. Second ball, striped it right down the middle. I make a routine bogey. Billy, what'd you have? Four. <laughs> no, Billy, you hit the ball in the lake. You took a six. Hell, Boydy, did you see how good that second drive was? <laughs> I don't know how you're keeping score, but I had a par. <laughs> He also considered a tree a temporary obstruction on the golf course. Why in the hell would they plant that tree right where I was going to hit the ball, Boydie? <laughs> Dear Billy, thank you for your attention to detail. Whether it was a catalog cover that had to be just right. I think if you look on these grounds, you see Billy Graves. The flowers are ripe. The grass was mowed this morning. You can get a scent of it as you pulled in on the grounds today. The ridiculous links he went to make sure the horse was safe and the people that were taking care of the horse were safe. The craziness that we sometimes went through at Saratoga to say, hey, Boydie, you need to move that drain two inches to the left and raise it two inches. Bill, you've lost your damn mind. Boydy, raise the drain two inches and move it to the left because it's right. And I think one of the reasons that you see the success that Bill had was his attention to detail. He held himself to extremely high standards and helped all of us achieve the standards of excellence. Dear Billy, thank you for the kindness to my father. He loved coming out to Phasic Tipton. It happened up generally about once a week. Almost always, he ended up in Bill's office hanging out with his boys. The endless banter with Bill and Dennis, Bain, Terrence, Max, Evan, and so forth was remarkable. Oftentimes, my dad would call me after he had left Facing Tipton and say, sorry, I didn't have time to see you today. <laughs> I was busy hanging out with my boys. If your mother calls, be sure and tell her I said hello. <laughs> I hope my dad and Bill are working on a Saratoga hat right now. I'm sure they are. Dear Billy, thank you for your loyalty and your support. We didn't always agree on a lot of things. <laughs> we would argue, scream, fight, cuss behind closed doors. It got ugly sometimes. You don't know a blankety-blank thing about a horse. Well, Billy, you don't know a blankety blankety thing about a dollar. And on and on it went. Inevitably, we would reach a decision. And once we made a decision, it was final, it was complete. Whoever conceded had the other one's back. There was never any, well, Boydie made that decision, what a dumbass he is. If the decision turned out wrong, Billy would say, it was the right decision or I made it. There's not many folks who are consistent in their approach in that regard. And Bill was one of the most loyal people and one of the most stand-up people that I've ever met. Dear Billy, thank you for not killing Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here to tell each and every one of you that he called him a lot of things other than Danny. <laughs> Dear Billy, thank you for being a mentor to Rusty, Tall Girl, Little Ev, Reedy, and countless others. One of the most amazing things over the last two weeks is to hear how many young people 
Say, Bill touched them and influenced them in a positive manner. Rick Waldman asked me the other night, was Bill a good mentor? And I kind of chuckled and I said, Bill would have killed me if I'd asked him to mentor anybody. That's a corporate term. Bill was one of the most gifted and remarkable teachers I've ever met. He was always willing and wanted to help someone who didn't have as much knowledge or didn't have as much experience and needed the help. He was always generous in his time. He was always generous in his gifts. So many of us think that we might have a little ability or a little edge. That we, the human nature is to kind of hold that inside for fear that if we share it, we might lose that. Well, Billy was the opposite. He was an extremely generous teacher. He was an extremely gifted teacher, and he touched thousands of lives as a result of that. Dear Billy, thank you for the laughter. There is no question that the worldwide leader, the worldwide leader in laughs is Fazig Tipton. <laughs> you just can't help it. One of the most crucial and important people in that legacy and that foundation was Bill Graves. We've heard stories about his wonderful storytelling abilities, and we all laughed again and again. <laughs> and the jokes that we had heard over and over. <laughs> but his smile and his enthusiasm were so infectious, his delight was so genuine that we all loved and shared so many laughs. And it's a great blessing to be able to have shared so many laughs in good times and in bad. Dear Billy, thanks for Brian. He came to us as a 16-year-old teenage boy. And I mean that in every regard. <laughs> We've watched him develop into an exceptional and gifted horseman. Billy and I would sometimes argue over who was a better horseman, Billy or Brian. I always chose Brian. <laughs> he knew I was right. <laughs> but we've watched Brian grow from a teenage boy to a wonderful horseman, to a great husband, and to a magnificent father. And in closing, I told Brian, and I'll say it publicly, and I'm telling Billy, don't worry. We're going to watch over him and his family just like you would have. Thank you. I'd have given you 10 to 1 odds on Boyd getting through that without a tear, and I congratulate you, Boyd. I know that that was a, a very difficult thing for you to do. We have another young and close friend of Bill's coming here to say a few words with Mr. Michael Levy. Please join us. I can tell you, I'm even money not to get through it, but we'll start from there. <clears throat> Billy would have wanted me to go home and get the trailer and bring a couple over here, see what they bring. Great turnout. <clears throat> you just watch old Billy Graves take this one up there and sell the hair off of it. Most often times he did. <clears throat> Most everyone in this room knows the history I share with Bill, so I'm going to try and keep the mood light, more so for me. We all know about Bill's accomplishments in the horse business, so I'm going to take a few steps away from that side of his life. Bill and I traveled a lot together, whether it be to horse sales, fishing, or golf. There are many funny stories, but I have a few I think you'll like. First year Bill and I stayed together in Saratoga, I was about 24, 25 years old. The house we had rented had a driveway that ran past the kitchen window. First morning we were there, about 6.30, I was in the kitchen making coffee. Old beat up diesel truck comes rumbling down the driveway. In the door without knocking comes a man with holes in his jeans and he says, this Billy Graves house? 
Now, I was still full of mainline Philly and just in the beginning stages of my Bill Graves Southern proper apprenticeship. So I said, yes, uh, how can I help you? Without a word, the man dives into the fridge and says, any beer in here? Now, I didn't understand him. That wasn't Philly. I said, excuse me, I asked him three times, any beer in here? With that, I went to the bottom of the staircase, yelled, Bill, there's a homeless guy down here speaking Virginia and looking for beer at 6.30 in the morning, says he knows you. From the top of the staircase comes, God damn it, Noel, leave that child alone. <laughs> that was my introduction to Bill's friend and accomplice, Noel Twyman. Bill loved the beach, in particular the Outer Banks of North Carolina. In fact, Billy introduced me to Southern Shores. Ah, oh, Mikey, you'll just love it down there. So away we went one summer after Saratoga, and we all rented a house, which became a commonplace trip year after year. Earlier that year, before this trip, Bill and I were going to Timonium for the May two-year-old sale. As we got off the plane, he went to get the rental car while I got the bags. As one would expect, Bill had noticed a very attractive lady seated behind us on the plane. As I was waiting at the baggage carousel, this lady approached me. Now remember, this was when Bill was about 48 or 49 and I was in my late 20s. So this woman says, excuse me, uh, that uh, gentleman you're traveling with, do you work for him? I said, no. <laughs> I said, we're just going to a horse sale. She then says, uh, well, where did he go? I said, uh, he's getting a rental car while I get the bags. It was obvious with the stare she gave me, she didn't believe one word I was saying. She then said, uh, would it be possible to get his autograph? <laughs> and I just laughed, I said, what? <laughs> she then proceeded to tell me how she was the biggest Richard Gere fan <laughs> and that she would just have to have his autograph. I said to her, Richard Gere, my ass. <laughs> of course, old Billy was so proud of that accomplishment and he reveled in it. So now back to the beach. Billy loved to go walking on the beach, loved it. One day we were down there, he said, Mikey, let's go for a walk. I said, okay, let me get Gus and his leash. Now Gus was a strong headed, sweet, but very active lab that we had at that time. And he had one of those harnesses because he liked to pull so hard. So we're walking down the beach and Gus is pulling me, not listening. And Bill finally had enough. Michael, it was always Michael when Bill was trying to teach me something. Michael, give me that damn leash. I'm gonna show you how to make this dog listen up and pay attention. Okay, Bill. So Bill, doing his best, heal up, you big-headed son of a gun. No, that's it. Oh, there you go. Pretty soon, Bill had Gus just walking alongside of us on a loose rein. I thought, man, that was pretty good. So we go on down the beach, and this is August in the Outer Banks, so it's pretty crowded. Uh, with Billy so very proud of his training accomplishments, he let his guard down just a tick. Mikey, look at those two beauties over there. As I turned to look, Gus had another plan in mind. As I turned back around, Gus, Gus had gotten the old jump on Billy G and was heading straight to the ocean and the momentum was on Gus's side. <laughs> I knew what Gus had on his mind, but Bill didn't. With Billy yelling, whoa, back you common son of a... <laughs> Gus had gotten Billy ankle deep before slowing down. On seeing the expression on Gus's face many times, I knew exactly what was getting ready to happen, so I calmly turned the other way and started walking back to the house. You see, Gus had to go, and he had to go number two. Now please picture Billy Richard Gear Graves on a crowded beach, ankle deep in water with a 120 pound Labrador squatting in the ocean. Over the years, Billy and I traded hundreds of horses, some good, some not so good. One year, we found a Carson City filly in Timonium. She was a little small, a little crooked, but in his words, Mikey, just look on that neck. Beautiful, just beautiful. Anyway, we bought her, and we decided to have some fun. 
She was already named by her two-year-old consigner. Long goodbye. Yeah, that's right. Long goodbye. Can't make that one up. Anyway, she wasn't anything special, hard trier, won a couple of races. Back in those days, I certainly knew a lot more than everyone else, even the trainer. We were at Churchill Downs for Long Goodbye's first race, and I had studied this thing for two days. I had it all figured out. So when the jockey came in, I told him exactly how the race was going to unfold, where he should be at every pole. And Billy's standing there with that Billy Graves look. Ay, ay, ay. Patient, yet frustrated with that furrowed brow. Dallas legged up the jock, and Billy turned to me and said, Michael, let me explain something to you. It was Michael again. First of all, that jockey doesn't speak a word of English, and he didn't understand what you said. <laughs> and even if he did, he ain't going to listen to you. I said, Billy, what should I have said? He said, simple, son. Just tell him to hurry home. Hurry home, Billy. It was one hell of a ride. If you haven't yet realized it, Bill was a huge part in Fasig Tipton's life, as he is with so many of you here today. I'd like to invite Bain Welker to come up and say a few words. This afternoon, I'm here to share a true story and deliver one final request. As most of you know, that knew Bill and me, you knew we spent a considerable amount of time together over the last nine and a half years. Some have gone on to say that uh, the most important decision we would make all day would be deciding where we would have lunch. <laughs> but over that time, going to horse sales, inspection seasons, and our infamous lunches, we touched on a lot of different topics. Bill was a professed curious George was curious about everything, so you never knew what topic we might land on on any given day. It takes me back a couple of years ago, and Bill was in the process of updating his will. And one day, traveling around, we got on the issue of our own mortality. And we discussed whether we preferred to be buried versus cremated, whether we decided to have a church service or a memorial or a celebration of life, and so on and so forth. And Bill turned to me and said, Bain, I'm 15, old, 15 years older than you are. I'll probably go before you do. I said, yeah, Billy, statistically speaking, you probably will. He said, you know, I'm bad about this teary-eyed stuff, and I want, something, want you to do something for me. I'm like, all right, Bill, I'm your friend. I'll do What do you want me to do, like go around and pass out tissues or something? He said, no, you ass. He said, I want you to tell one of my jokes at your service. I said, Billy, it doesn't work like that. You're the funny guy, I'm the straight guy. I line up the jokes and you deliver them. He's like, yeah. I said, why don't we get Dennis to do it? Dennis is a funny guy. He goes, nah, we're not going to get Danny to do it. Danny will turn the joke around on me. <laughs> so I was like, all right. So the day went on. We had a few more stops. And as we headed back to Fasig Tipton, I could tell something was on his mind. As we pulled in, I said, Billy, you're thinking awful hard. What's on your mind? He said, you'll do this for me, right? I said, do what? He said, you'll tell one of my jokes at a service if necessary. I said, Billy, I'm your friend. Is there any specific joke you want me to tell? He said, no, you know all my jokes. Just use your own discretion. <laughs> I didn't know Father Chris was going to be here today. You took most of my, took most of my uh, uh, jokes away. So anyhow, for better or for worse, here goes. Outside of Richmond, Virginia, there's an insane asylum. And in the yard, there were two patients sitting on a bench. One's name was Dennis. <laughs> one's name was Bill. And about that time, a pigeon flew over and did what pigeons often do and landed a package right on the top of Dennis's head. 
Dennis looked up. Dennis turned to Bill. Said, Bill, would you bring me some toilet paper? Bill turned to Dennis and said, sure, Dennis, but by the time I get back, that pigeon's going to be clear across the James River. <laughs> Nobody laughed at his jokes any more than Bill. Billy, from our family at Phasing Tipton, from the bottom of my heart, we love you, we miss you, we're going to keep your spirit and your humor going forward. We are coming towards the end of the more formal part of our celebration of Bill's life today, and we're honored to have join us Father Chris Clay, who is going to come up and give us a prayer. As soon as that is over, we would love every one of you to, in, to join us in the Kentucky Room, which is alongside the sales ring, where we will have yet another and unending chance to tell more Bill Graves stories than you could ever imagine and raise a glass to him. So please join us after we have finished. Father Chris. Well, you may be wondering why a Catholic priest is up here to give the closing blessing, and you can blame Dennis Lynch for me being up here. And really, it, it, the beautiful thing is, is it really is, the reason I'm up here is friendship. The friendship of Dennis for his friend Bill. And Dennis goes to St. Paul's Church where I serve and, and uh, Dennis texts it and is like, hey, if you're over at UK Hospital, can you go and see Bill Graves? And uh, I was like, sure, and, and uh, you know, um, Bill not being Catholic, I asked, well, is that okay if, if Bill would like me to come, come by, you know, as, as, a, as a Catholic priest? And so Dennis checked. He's like, yeah, sure, sure. And so came over, and that first time to be with Brian and his dad, and um, I think Leslie was there as well, and uh, we just said a little prayer together. And uh, I think it went something like, Jesus, I give my life to you, and I ask for your healing and blessing for me. And as, as Bill said that prayer, it was something so simple, so direct. And it was a moment that really brought to, to mind this psalm that some of you may have prayed before, it's Psalm 131, and it goes like this. Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I do not busy myself with great matters, with things too sublime for me. Rather, I have stilled my soul like a weaned child to its mother. Weaned is my soul. Israel, hope in the Lord now and forever. And having that image of a weaned child, a child resting in his mother's arms. And kind of having that image that that's how it is at any time in our life, whether we're young or old, that we're always resting in the arms of our Father in heaven. And so the second time I was seeing someone else at UK Hospital and the thought came to mind, check and see if Bill Graves is, is here. So I check, and they're like, well, he's in the ER. And so I went down and, 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 and showed up unannounced, and Brian's like, you know, it's not usually a good sign if a priest shows up. Um, so Bill came out of the, um, he was having a test and came back into the room, and, and I came and was like, Bill, would you like a prayer? And he's like, yes. And as we prayed, there was such, it was like a thirsty man taking a drink of water. And as he closed his eyes, he was receiving that 
living water of grace in his heart. And it was that strong hand and arms of God just enveloping and surrounding him that was such a blessing, such a grace. And it was that awareness that with God, it's so simple, so surrendering to realize that God is always there for us if we open our hearts and minds. And so the third time I came by to see Bill, it brings to mind this passage from Matthew. I give praise to you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for although you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, you have revealed them to the childlike. Yes, Father, such has been your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the One, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor in our burden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. And as we are looking out upon the beautiful sunny day in Lexington with the sun shining, Bill had such a immense gratitude. It was a Thursday, a week ago Thursday, and he was so grateful for the gift of life. And he says, you know, some people say, thank God, you know, when, you know, they have a good horse sale or something. And as he looked at me, he says, thank God. And I really mean it. I really mean it. Thank God. And when he said that simple word, thank God, it was like he was saying every good gift, everything is a gift. Everything is a blessing. Everything comes from God. And it was awareness that that love that God gives us is always there for us. And, you know, I th sometimes think that we look at faith and religion and, and everything like this question. When horses are afraid, are fearful of something, what do they do? They run away. They flee. In those three times visiting with Bill, he brought this truth that that love of God isn't something that we need to run away from, but to just turn and receive and rest in that love that God has given us. And that's the beauty that we can take today as we go forth, that each and every one of you here is that testament of that love of friendship. And that that love of friendship and the memories and the joys that have been shared is that little gift of God's love that Bill gave so generously and how he enriched each one of you. And that's something that we can take to heart as we go forth like a mare and foal grazing on the field in the evening twilight. That that simplicity of a horse, a mare and foal grazing, God wants us to graze on his grace and receive it the way that Bill did in those last days. So let us take a moment as we take leave, and may our farewell express our affection for him, for our dear brother Bill, may he ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ, which conquer, conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Bill in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, you will rise with him on the last day. For in you we live and move and have our being. And you bless us with the gift of all creation. And we thank you for the blessings which you bestowed upon Bill in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, 
turn towards us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your Son and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. And may Almighty God bless each one of you in our dear brother Bill, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. I thought this was going to be one of the toughest days of my life. It's turned out to be one of the most uplifting days of my life. And I can't thank everybody here enough, people that have traveled from the east and west coast, from all over the Mid-Atlantic region, from Florida, we thank his family. We thank Reed and Ditty for being here today. Please join us in the Kentucky Room, and let's just have a good time in remembrance of our good friend, Bill Graves. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>